Last week I talked about a few booklets, well one in particular, uh, choosing a Bible up here is for y'all's use, and I got two more pamphlets that I thought might be helpful. One is called How We Got the Bible, which is a history of the Bible and uh, how it got into the English language, and then Why Trust the Bible. Uh, a lot of things we've been talking about here are included in this, so y'all feel free to take, take these and use them uh, to your edification and benefit, hopefully, you will remember some of the things that we go through, uh, even though some of it's kind of technical. Well, we're going to continue this morning with our New Testament uh, evaluation of uh, the transmission of the text and how we have the Bible we have today. This is a good slide. I have to give credit. This is uh, uh, a scholar in uh, Phoenix uh, Seminary named Paul Wegner, and he was nice enough I uh, found uh, a, a class that he had taught similar to this online, and I emailed him and asked him if, because he kept referring to a, a booklet he had given out, and he was nice enough to give me the, some of these slides. So I'll give him the credit uh, for these fancy slides. I wouldn't have time to put something together like this. So, but this is just a timeline of our New Testament text. Uh, the New Testament books were written between zero, well, technically the last part of the first century A.D. And then you notice what we talked about last week, the early writing paper that they had in the first centuries after Christ were papyrus. And these P with the numbers represent different papyrus fragments, uh, or manuscripts that they have. And you can see that in the early centuries, all we have is these papyrus. And these are these key ones that are very, uh, you know, in the second century after Christ. So within a hundred years of the writing of the, of the uh, letters or the Gospels, we have some copies of these, uh, of these books in early manuscripts. Uh, these, the manuscripts with letters, capital letters, and also manuscripts with a zero before them and then a, a number after, refer to uncial manuscripts, you remember all capitalized lettering that uh, were written on vellum or parchment, a leather-based material, and we start seeing these come into existence in the uh, uh, fourth century here. Uh, these are key ones here. This is the uh, Hebrew letter Aleph, uh, first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's a key one stands for Codex Sinaiticus, uh, which is dated around, you know, between 300 and 400 A.D. This is B, is another key one, I think is Vaticanus, Codex Vaticanus, and A is Codex Alexandrius, and that's also a key manuscript. So we start, and these are, by and large, these are almost complete manuscripts. So we're getting into a few early manuscripts that have all of the uh, New Testament as well as the Septuagint of the Old Testament are in these books as well. When we get later on, uh, numbers out here, well, they're out here. We start getting just numbers without the zero in front of them. These refer to the uh, minuscule text, which is the, you know, the lowercase cursive writing we talked about. And so you can see that this writing really didn't come about till pretty late after the books were written. So most of your manuscripts that they have in numbers are going to be this type of manuscripts, but they're also much later. So you've got a, a, a lot of copies between here and out here uh, in some of these manuscripts. So we, we do see some of the errors and, and things creep in. You've got some of your major translations here. Mainly, we want to, you know, the Latin versions, the old Latin was translated very early. And then uh, Jerome came and did a retranslation in, of the Bible into Latin Vulgate around 400 AD. So that's a key one that uh, uh, the textual critics used. But you also have some other languages, the Syriac, uh, Coptic versions, Ethiopian, Armenian. Arabic versions of the Bible that were translated 
fairly early. So they also use these translations when they look at the text. So good slide, overall view. All right, we want to look at a few, just textual criticism pretty fast. It's very similar to what we talked about with the Old Testament and how they do it. Uh, the, one difference is, you remember the Hebrew Bible that I brought in is mainly a translation of that they have because they feel it's representative of the Masoretic text that uh, they copied down through the centuries. Now, with the Old Testament, they, they have a different uh, perspective. They approach it from an eclectic text view, which is mean they, they review all of the manuscripts they have on a particular book. Uh, they review the translations, the early translations they have, and then they'll, they try to, to pick out those, those things in those texts that they feel were not original. And then they write a Greek text, as we uh, looked at last week, that uh, will have commentaries on why they made a certain choice if they have a variant. If there's a difference in two manuscripts, uh, they come to a conclusion. And then in the footnotes, they'll give that alternate reading. So you're never left with just a reading, even if there's a our, our New Testament uh, Greek t- Bibles tell us what all the alternate readings are. So you're not just given a reading and say, this is it. They give you an option to see what's out there as well. So they critics evaluate all the sources and seek to choose the most accurate reading for each passage. And this is what they've got to choose from. You remember last week we talked about all the manuscripts, 5,700 uh, New Testament manuscripts composed of... Uh, uh, you've got lectionaries in here as well, which were, you know, yearly, where the Bible was broken up into uh, w- daily readings that the uh, uh, church would do. And so it had the text in it as well. So you've got your Greek manuscripts, you've got your early translations, and then you've got your church fathers, which we talked about. There's over a million quotes of scripture in the church fathers. Uh, and they say that even if we didn't have any Greek manuscripts, we could still put the Bible together with just the quotations in the church fathers. And so they look at all of this, and then they try to compose. All right, what did the original Greek text most plausibly say? This is another one of Paul Wigner's slides. Just wanted to look at these a little bit. We we discussed these last time. When we get into some of the unintentional mistakes that scribes made. Uh, these are some of the most common ones. Uh, mistaken letters. You know, he, he tries to put it in an English, well, in our English copying. If we did it in English, what would we do? One uh, mistake would be substituting a U for a V or vice versa. Is, you know, when you're going along and you see a similar letter and you, you write the wrong letter. That's a mistake. But uh, textual critics know, know to look for that, and they're able to compare manuscripts and see when that happens. Homophony, a similar sounding word, there for there. Different spelling. Sometimes these scribes would write where, in order to get multiple copies out, they'd have a person stand in the front and read the text. And you'd have all these scribes out here who were writing copies as, uh, as it was being read. So if you hear a word, You've got two, the word sounds the same, different spelling. You know, but they might put the wrong spelling in the text. Haplography, omission of a letter or word. Uh, you know, occurrence, occurrence. This one has one R, this one has two R's. Uh, I do this all the time in my uh, typing. Not copying anything, just typing, and I'll, I'll do it as well. Dediography, writing a letter or word twice. Ladder. Or later. Again, this time you're substituting an extra letter instead of taking away a letter. Metathesis, reversing the order of two letters or words, H-T-E for the. I do that all the time. I don't know about you, but when I'm typing, I do that. And if you don't catch it, you don't notice it, it'll go, go forward. Fusion, incorrect word divisions, White House for White House. You know, they separated the two words here. Here it's a compound word, I guess. Uh, So that's another mistake that could be made. Fission, incorrect putting words together. The opposite, grandchild for grandchild. 
And then finally, just an omission. He gives an example in the Old Testament uh, where you, you overlooked a section in the passage and you just completely omitted it. Unintentional, you didn't mean to do it, but it happens. So those are the common ones. These are some of the intentional changes that perhaps were, that were made in the text by the scribes as they copied. Changes in grammar, spelling. Uh, he gives some examples here of Old and New Testament. Uh, in Matthew here, I think uh, Asaph is the king named in uh, the genealogy in Matthew 1. Uh, and one copyist changed it to Asa because he probably wanted to match up with his first king's passage. So he thought he was doing a favor. Well, Matthew might have got it wrong or something, you know, but uh, they made this change, an intentional change, you know, uh, not critical, but he was, he was trying to make these uh, passages correspond to one another. Harmonization is another one just like that, where they modify a passage to agree with another passage. You most commonly see this in the Gospels. Uh, in Luke 23, words similar to John 19:20 were added by later copyists. Uh, so, John 19:20 and Luke 23 have a similar, the same story, but there's a, you know, a verse here or a, a comment here, but it's not here. Sometimes the uh, the scribes would want to match them up, make them say the same thing, and so that's what they call harmonization trying to make the the Gospels completely harmonize with one another. Uh, Another one, adding natural uh, compliments or words that go together. Uh, You know, sometimes you hear a phrase over and over again, and if you you come across it again, you hear it, and you say, well, this has got to follow it. So sometimes that would, a scribe would would do that. In this case, uh, here he's talking about and Pharisees was added to the word scribes. So, you know, scribes and Pharisees sort of go together. You see that a lot in the Gospels. In this particular case, it was only scribes, but the copyists added and Pharisees. So, again, he's trying to, to make it sound like, uh, you know, that sort of could be unintentional too. Maybe you think they go together. Clearing up difficulties. Uh, Here's one in Mark where there's a quote from Malachi, uh, and it's attributed to Isaiah. But in this quote here in Mark, there's more than one quote from a prophet. Isaiah is quoted, but there's also another prophet quoted. So the scribe said, well, look, these quotations is more than just Isaiah. So he changed it from Isaiah to the prophets. <laughs> so it make, makes sense because you've got quotes. Usually when... Uh, when uh, author wrote and quoted from more one source, the major source was the one perhaps given the credit, in this case Isaiah. All right, conflated readings, combining two or more readings, uh, theological changes. This one is when a scribe was trying to protect the virgin birth. So in Luke 2, instead of uh, where it attributes Christ to being uh, the child of Joseph and Mary, he changes it to Joseph and his mother. Uh, so he tried to get away that, from the fact that it might sound that Joseph was the biological father of Jesus. So they changed things like that. And then other additions, uh, here's just where uh, a man is added to the end of a verse. So there's some common uh, intentional changes. Does it sound like a conspiracy here, though? Does it sound like there's, these scribes are just trying to completely redo what the Bible teaches us? I, no, I'd say no. They're, not, they're trying to do things probably. They should, I don't think they should have done it, but uh, the fact that they did it is what textual critics try to find out and why. All right, those are, uh, when we look at, uh, we talked about external and internal evidence when you evaluate a manuscript. External evidence deals with those things outside of the text. For instance, we look at the date of the text, which is a key one, the character, or how good uh, a witness of it is to the text type. We talked about the Alexandrian, the Byzantine, and the Western text type. Uh, How does it fit within a particular text type? 
you know, even within, the, within these text types, you'll have primary or secondary. Primary would perhaps be closer to the, the original text type, and then you do somehow get vari variations moving away from that. So you even have divisions within the certain text type. And then geographical distribution. If a variant found in geographically widespread locations in the first century is most likely to be original than the one that is found in only one location. So if you see a variant that's found in uh, text from Rome to Alexandria to uh, Byzantine, uh, that's more likely to be original than one that's just found in a certain geographical area. All right, internal evidence, the evidence within the text itself. Uh, we, you deal with the scribal errors, as we've already mentioned, simple copyist mistakes, vowel changes, intentional changes, literary construction, and characteristics writing style or use of certain phrases by an author. And this is one that some of the critics would jump on. They'll sit there and say, well, this couldn't be written by Paul because it's totally different characteristic writing style than uh, he, he used in Romans or somewhere. You know, that just really doesn't hold a lot of weight because, uh, you know, your, your, your uh, audience, who you're writing to, sometimes is very critical of how you're going to write. Uh, I mean, if you're writing to a, you're writing a book for a seven, eight, ten-year-old child, you're probably going to write it differently than you would writing to an adult. Uh, you're writing to someone who, you know, knows your language very well. English is their everyday language versus someone who doesn't know English very well. You might write different. So that's a, it's kind of a weak argument, I think, when they try to discourage some of the authors of our New Testament. All right, just this here. You see, this is a good example of a correction that a scribe made. And as he's copying it, he puts a correction in the text itself. And, you know, the textual critic has to say, well, is that an original? Is that part of the original? Or is that something? Is there a textual note that he's making? So that's why they compare all the manuscripts to, to come to that conclusion. You know, we talked about these before. We're going to run through them pretty fast. The basic rules for textual criticism. Uh, manuscripts must be weighed, not counted, as we talked about earlier, the the Byzantine text is, has, is called the majority text, pretty much, because we have more manuscripts of, the, of those than any others, but those are much later in time. Just because a reading may have a lot of witnesses, uh, it generally may not be weighed the same. Older manuscripts would generally carry more weight than a more recent one since it is closer to the original. Weight is determined by age, accuracy, and a manuscript's relationship to other manuscripts. Now, part of that, your, your, your Greek manuscripts are always going to carry more weight than, say, the Latin Vulgate, uh, because it's in the original uh, language that the text was written in. You determine which readings will, would most likely give rise to others. You know, a lot of these translations that they look at, Coptic, Arabic, Aramean, uh, those are also translations from the Latin Vulgate. So you've got a translation from Greek to Latin Vulgate and then from Latin Vulgate into other languages. So that's what that one means. You've got really a two-translation process, a movement there. So the further, more translations you get, the further away from the uh, original language you get, the more likelihood you're getting some differences in those translations. The more distinct reading is preferable. The scribe would have a tendency to make a reading easier to read rather than harder. He would make it read so he could understand it. So instead of, uh, you know, taking away, uh, or, or if you come across a reading that's real easy, one reading that's hard, the textual critics tend to say that the harder reading would probably be original because uh, no scribe's going to make it harder to read. <laughs> I guess some teachers might do that, you know, make something harder to read. But uh, when they try to copy it, they try to make it so they could understand it. <laughs> The shorter reading is usually favored. A uh, scribe would more likely add to the text and take away from it, such as putting a clarifying note as, as to why something means. Very rarely uh, do they think that the, the, the scribes would take away from the text. They would more likely add to it. And after all this is done, they determine which reading is most appropriate to the context. Uh, 
He began looking at literary structure, grammatical or spelling errors, and historical context. You know, an author's use of words is considered, uh, but uh, not an aspect of uh, uh, whether this is a whether Paul was the author. But if there's just one phrase in a letter that's completely, totally different from what the, they would think uh, Paul would write, then uh, you know they'd look, they evaluate that phrase in relationship to other manuscripts. All right, I want to run through a history of uh, textual criticism, and you know how it's come about. What, why is it an important thing to us today? You know, Jerome translating the Latin Vulgate from the Old Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, and it became the main Bible in use for more than a thousand years. Greek was almost forgotten in the Western Church once the schism between the Eastern and Western Church occurred. You know, you know, we're celebrating the uh, 400th year this year of the King James Bible. It's been, well, 1611 is when it was uh, uh, produced. But it ain't got nothing on Latin Vulgate yet. It's uh, Latin Vulgate was the Bible in the Western Church for a thousand years. Uh, it's the, it, and the, the thing about it is not a lot of people knew how to read it. Even the priest had uh, limited knowledge of, of reading the Latin Bible, which is, you know, a shame. Erasmus, hopefully y'all have heard of him. He was uh, a contemporary of Martin Luther and got into some theological debates with Luther as well, but we have to give him credit on this. He is the one who prepared the first Greek New Testament in 1516. All right, his text was based on a half a dozen, so we're talking six here, uh, minuscule manuscripts. Now, with the oldest being Codex I from the 10th century. So the, er the earliest manuscript he had came from the 10th century. Uh, one thing to note, since he did not have the last page of Revelation, he ended up translating the last six verses from the Latin into the Greek. And it became the standard text for about 400 years, even though it was not the best. So, and I think that, that some of that uh, translation is probably still in uh, what we refer to as the Textus Receptus. The term Textus Receptus, or Received Text, was the name given to the Greek New Testament published in 1633. This text was published by the Elzevir family, uh, and it's basically one that uh, is Erasmus' text with certain modifications made. Erasmus had different editions came out of his Greek New Testament it was the one accepted by the people and became the text used for early English translations, including the King James Version and other English translations up until 1881. You see some others who put out text based on Erasmus text, Stephanus and Beza as well, later on also published Greek text. Now this is what the Textus Receptus, this is what the King James is based on. This is the Greek text they will use when they translated the Bible. Now at the time, it's, it's what they had. But what did I say? How many manuscripts did Erasmus have when he made his Greek text? Six manuscripts. What was the earliest date? Tenth century. So almost a thousand years. Nine hundred thousand years. And uh, a lot of those were Byzantine texts, so they're not early texts, and they're further away from the original writings. So that is, is one of the issues you have when you come to the King James. Uh, it's based on manuscripts that are not necessarily the best manuscripts. You know, well, how many manuscripts do we have today? All right, 5,000 plus. O almost over 5,700 manuscripts compared to six manuscripts. So we've got a lot more manuscripts to look at, to evaluate, to determine what would be the best text to use. Steve? This is a quick question. Um, the King James was done in 1611, and the Texas Receptus was done in 1633. The King James must have been done based on Erasmus. Yeah, you're, yeah I think gradually uh, it was probably done on one of these earlier, right? That's a good point. 
Uh, I think eventually when they made uh, changes or edit modifications of the King James, they probably did go back to this text, but early on it probably was one of the earlier ones rather than that. I don't know that either. The King James went through several editions. All right. And those were changed. You know, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and criticize the King James because I grew up with it. I think most of us might have grown up with it. The thing is, we've got to remember that when you come to differences in your modern Bibles, English translations compared to King James, you've got to take this into account that uh, they're not based on the best manuscripts. They're not translated based on the best manuscripts. I mentioned earlier, a few weeks ago, I think, there is a translation now where uh, a guy took the King James and he translated it back into Greek, and now he has a Greek manuscript that completely matches the King James. Of course, there is no ancient manuscript that matches his manuscript that has ever been found. <laughs> so, you know, you can say they got a Greek text now, but it's like, sort of backwards the way you got it. So... <laughs> So just keep that in mind when you determine a translation. I mean, the King James was, was awesome for its day. Uh, it's, to, to be in, uh, still around for 400 years and still being used by people, that's great. You know, the way they wrote it, the, uh, the, 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 the readability of it uh, is, is, is a great thing. Brandon? I, I think the Texas Receptus was used to... Uh, uh, update the King James Version after the time of the new Charles II. So what you have in the early form of the King James is, is uh, I don't know if it's Basil or Stephanus, but mm -hmm. it's one of those. And then it's after the time of King Charles II, they did an, uh, an updated edition, and they did the Texas Receptus then. So I think it was sometime after uh, 1650, something like that. Okay. So, Bodes that anybody's argument that the King James has stayed the same and is an original text for the English Bible uh, kind of totally destroys that because, as Stephen pointed out, there have been several editions and there were some of those editions that were made even before 1700. So it's not as though in 1611 they, they made an English edition and they've never changed it from 1611 on. That's not the case. And what you see about the Texas Receptus is important because there are some things in the Texas Receptus that because of things you brought forward with the numerous amount of manuscripts we have now, we can put together a little bit better Greek text than even the Texas Receptus. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a debate about that as well because guys still say, oh, you've got to use the Texas Receptus. <laughs> These scholars get all mad if you don't use anything but the Texas Receptus. And yeah. There's... You know, I think the argument you're making, though, is very valid, fair, and very right. Well, there's a, there's a it, story about one of the editions of the King James Bible. It's, yeah. printed, it's called the Adulterers. Yeah. Now, all right, we'll, we'll discuss more of that when we get to uh, translations, but I just want to bring it up while we're here. This is, this is why. Uh, if, you, if you run across a, whole, a King James only person, uh, you know, this is my argument with them. But if you want to use the King James, use it. <laughs> you know, it's a good translation. It's a literal translation, essentially literal, so it's almost a word for word. And it's, and it's one that's got a lot of, and actually, most, some of the majority of our current Bibles are really just different editions of the King James, but they look at these older manuscripts and make changes based on older manuscripts. So some of the phraseology in our modern Bibles came from the King James Bible. All right, during the 1800s, the development of textual criticism moved forward. Carl Latchman was the first to publish a Greek text, text based entirely upon textual critical principles. He basically abandoned the Textus Receptus around 1831-1850. Constantine von Tischendorf was a German textual scholar who dedicated his life to finding and publishing New Testament manuscripts. He was the one who discovered Codex Sinaiticus at St. Catherine's Monastery in the middle of the 19th century, a key manuscript. In 1881, 
Westcott and Hort published a Greek t New Testament, which was arrived at by applying textual principles. They were the initial ones to divide the manuscripts into families. They're the ones who, who saw these similarities in certain groups of manuscripts, and so they came up with this family concept. They felt the one that was closest to the original Greek text was that of the Alexandrian family. And then in 1898, the Novum Testamentum Gracia was produced by Eberhard Nessel, dealing the final blow to the text of Receptus. I, I speak that, you know, smiling here. Uh, in 1955, the American Bible Society formed an international group to prepare another Greek text. At the same time, Kurt Allen was working on still another Greek text. And the fruit of these labors were two Greek texts, which now are exactly the same with respect to the Greek manuscript, but only differ in the textual apparatus, which is the listing of sources for the variant readings. Now, what that means, we have two main Greek texts today. We have the Nestle Allen, based on those two uh, individuals we mentioned earlier. And this one is in its 27th edition. So you see, even now, when new manuscripts are found, they'll take the Greek text and they'll evaluate it based on new evidence. If they find an old manuscript, they'll look at it and say, well, maybe this is, we got to change this. So they've gone through 27 editions of their text. United Bible Society, Greek New Testament is in its fourth edition. The text it's saying, uh, the, the Greek text itself reads exactly the same. The difference is in the textual apparatus. And when I talk about apparatus, I'm talking about notes that tell us what the variants are and which manuscripts support that different reading. We'll look at that in a minute. The Nestle Allen text, textual apparatus, provides information on all the variants in the Greek text, but does not go into complete details. It's the witness for those variants. So if you want to know what all the variants are in all the manuscripts, that's the text you want to look at, because it has all the variants. But the key is it won't go in as much detail. Now, the UBS Greek New Testament only focuses on the most important variants, but it gives all the witnesses. So if you want to know all the witnesses for a particular major variant reading, that's the one to use. And I forget, translators use one of these, uh, perhaps this one, those who translate in the Bible into other languages, uh, versus those who want to do a study of the text itself might, might use this one. I tried to modify this. This is what you'd see in a, uh, this is the uh, Greek New Testament fourth edition. This is how it reads. We just want to go through one example real quick here. Uh, probably be what we finish up with. But this section is the Greek text itself. This is from Ephesians chapter 1. This would be the textual notes, and we'll get a closer up look of that. This is where they discuss the modern translations that may use one or particular of the different readings, and this deals with similar wordings. The, the, the variant here we're looking at is in Ephesus, in verse 1 of chapter 1. Uh, key things to remember, the, uh, the textual notes in this, in this Greek text will have a letter A through D, uh, at the very beginning. Here you see a C. This is just their opinion here saying if they give it an A reading, they feel that uh, it's very certain that this was the reading in the original. While if it's given a D reading, that means there's a lot of uncertainty that that was the reading. If it's a B or C, that's somewhere in between where, what they feel it might have been original or most likely would not have been. Uh, P stands for papyrus. Uh, Uncial manuscript is a letter or a number beginning with zero. Just a number is a minuscule manuscript. And then Byzantine lectionaries, nether virgins, nether church fathers. So when you're reading, your, if you read Greek, you're reading this. This actually is in brackets here. When you see something in brackets, it should give you a sign, hey, this is a major uh, variant here, something that they're uncertain about. Now here's the close-up of the textual notes. This is what you'd see. You see it, the uh, footnote here. The first uh, textual note here is in verse 1. 
They give in a C. So C means they think it's uncommon or uncertain, pretty uncertain about whether that was part of the original. Now, usually the first reading they give is the one that they put in the text itself. Sometimes, if it's a popular reading, they'll put brackets on it and still put it in the text. And we'll, we'll probably get into a few of those later. But they say, in Ephesus is a, a reading uh, that is in the text. Of course, it's in brackets. And then they start naming off all the witnesses to this particular reading. Now, some of the key ones here is, this is uh, Codex Sinaiticus. It's a good manuscript, but this is found by a corrector of the Codex Sinaiticus. So somewhere in this section, a corrector, and they're able to distinguish the different writings of uh, the original writer and then those who came later and added things, a corrector put this in. So that supports this reading. Uh, Codex A is Alexandrinus, supports it. Codex B, with a footnote 3, means there's a third handwriting, which is after the 4th century. So you have the original, you have a secondary corrector, and a third corrector. The third corrector came in and added this in Ephesus to the text. And then you have a few other early manuscripts that deal with, that have it included. The Vulgate has it, Syriac and Coptic versions have it listed there. And you, you see all these. First of all, they'll start with the, uh, usually if it's a papyrus that gives evidence, that will be first. Then your uncial manuscripts are second, and then followed by your Byzantine or uh, uh, your minuscule witnesses later. This is not all of them. Well, well, I take it back. This is probably all of them that support it. You have your Byzantine lectionary. You have your uh, your translations, your Syrian, your Coptic, your Gothic, and then you have your church fathers. So those are all the evidence given for that in Ephesus being in the original. When you come to a slash, double slash, that means I'm fixing to give you the second reading, which is found in manuscripts. And omit here simply means that the in Ephesus is not in the text in these manuscripts. We have a papyrus here. P46 from 2nd century, Alexandrian family, very early. We have also Sinaiticus, except in this case it's in the original hand. So the original copier of Codex Sinaiticus did not put in Ephesus in the text. Also we have the original hand of Codex Vaticanus. It was not in there. We have a few uh, Marcion, Tertullian, a few early church fathers, and a few late manuscripts from uh, minuscule manuscripts that also don't have it. So by and large, we don't have a lot of evidence giving us the reason, or uh, giving the, the reading that it was not in the text. But we do have a lot of evidence in terms of quantity that it is in the text. Of course, as we discussed earlier, these are more early. These are much earlier than the evidence found with it being in the text. So, what do you do? This is what the textual critic does. He's got this evidence. He says, all right, am I going to put it in the text? Or am I going to leave it out? What's the reason? Well, you see, they come up with a C uh, reading here. And this is uh, based on Bruce Metzger's textual commentary on the Greek New Testament. Uh, the editors of the Greek New Testament include the phrase in Ephesus, but put them in brackets to indicate that they are not in the earliest text. However, it seems unusual that Paul did not include the name of the church that he is writing to, which was his common practice. Based upon the evidence given above, the earliest manuscripts did not have the phrase in Ephesus, but later on it appears to be there. Modern New Testament scholars believe that the book of Ephesians was written as a circular letter to the churches in the regions of Galatia, but that originally it was sent to Ephesus, and they were to copy it and send it on to other churches. Thus the place where the name of the church was left blank until the copyist knew what church his letter was to go, and then they put in the name. This seems reasonable and helps explain the evidence given above. And then he says, we agree with this reading as variant as a C reading, and that there seems to be pretty good evidence that this was a circular letter, but that Ephesus appears to be the main city in that area and would receive the letter first. So, given an uncertainty, 
that the in Ephesus was in the original. Now we go through all that, you know, but is any doctrine changed here <laughs> based on this? No. There's no doctrine that's really in effect by what the letter, where the letter was written. But this is what a textual critic will do. You've just gone through the process. It's simplified. And, uh, and you have this available to you if you pick up a Greek New Testament. You can, even if you don't know Greek that well, you can still follow and look at the evidence that is given for these different variants. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. If you come across a particular passage that's really got some debate, you could pick it up and say, well, who supports this reading versus this reading? Of course, this is easy because you've got two readings. Sometimes you might have three. You know, hopefully you don't get into one with more than that. All right, I'm going to stop here and we will get forward. I want to, we've talked about these variants, you know, just to, as a start to think about for next week. Again, here's our friend Bart Ehrman. There are more variations among the manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. And other places he states that the number of variants is as high as 400,000 variants in the New Testament. Well, the fact is, that's true. That's true. But there's a lot of things we need to look at, consider those variants, and that's what we'll look at next week. We're going to finish up the New Testament section, hopefully next week, and... and, uh, and deal with that. So any questions about, tried to, we ran through textual criticism of the New Testament, we ran through a brief history of, of how they've come about with our modern Greek text and uh, why they do it, and then we did a brief uh, look at a passage and how they go about doing, determining if it was original or, or not. And next week we'll look at these variants and we'll break them down into categories and determine why that number is really not as uh, scary as it appears to be on its surface. I mean, he, he's not telling us anything new. He's just come out with a new book released last week called Forged. So he's still on the money-making track of... Uh, and uh, listen to James White give an editorial on it, and sounds like more of the same things. Of course, he's getting more into the authorship, saying that a lot of the books attributed to Paul were not written by Paul, things of that nature. So... Uh, I'm not going to recommend you read it <laughs> unless you, you just want to see what he's saying. Well, good. Got good stuff here. So uh, we'll go ahead and close up in prayer as we get ready to go to worship. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for being with us as we traveled, for the rain that you give us, for keeping us safe and, and bringing us to your house on your day to, to meet with your people and to worship you and, and talk about you and glory in you. We thank you for this study, Lord, and pray that we'll be mindful of it to continue to be confident in the scriptures that we have, are your words given to us for doctrine and for life. And, and we pray that we will be attentive to your Bible, Lord. For many years, your, your people did not have your word, and we have it today so abundantly. May we never take it for granted. And may we continue to read it and study it and use it in our lives. We ask you to go with us now as we enter into worship and focus our thoughts upon you, Lord. We pray in Christ.